Uh, good morning. Welcome everyone to the 29th meeting of the Finance and Constitution Committee in 2017. I can remind everyone present to switch off their mobile phones, or at least put in the mode that don't interfere. Um, no apologies have been received. We're now I, ag agenda item number one, and the, the committee is asked to agree items three and four in private. Are we agreed? We are agreed. Uh, we now come to agenda item two, uh, and the committee will take evidence on the Scottish Parliament's corporate bodies budget for 2018-19. And I welcome to, for this discussion Jackson Car Carlaw, MSP from the corporate body, uh, Sir Paul Grice, the Chief Executive, Derek Crow, who is the Head of Finance and Security, and Michelle Hegarty, who is the Assistant Chief Executive. Uh, Jackson Carlaw, uh, do you wish to make a few opening statements? Just briefly, thank you, uh, convener. Uh, good morning and good morning, colleagues. Um, last year when I came here, it was as a young ingenue to these matters following the uh, tragic loss of our colleague Alec Johnson. Uh, at least this year I come having been immersed in the agenda of the issues we're discussing for a little bit longer. Uh, in that session with you last year, I noted that there were a range of issues facing the corporate body that whilst we could foresee them, we were not yet in a position to quantify in our budget. And they were specifically the implications of the Brexit decision following the referendum across the UK in 2016, uh, the work to reform Parliament that was going to emerge from the Parliamentary uh, Commission uh, and improve how we do and what we do it. And I also noted the evidence of renewed energy at the start of session five amongst all our colleagues, with new powers being handed to us and a noticeable increase in the volume of business. In fact, it's some 45% of an increase in overall business in the first year of this parliament compared to the first year of the last, uh, which is quite considerable. And, and we can talk about that in more detail if it's helpful to the committee, but particularly more committee meetings and longer committee meetings, uh, which have quite an implication on resource. It's the corporate body's view that our parliament is busier than ever. It's facing significant change, and this combined with the impact of its new powers means that it's no longer sustainable to continue to fund these recurring costs from our contingency, and that was what I alluded to last year. Therefore, the corporate body proposes a budget which aims to reflect the new circumstances the Parliament faces, and in doing so, it proposes a medium-term financial plan which seeks to address known pressures, anticipated risks and opportunities to improve Parliament's performance in a planned and proportionate manner through till the end of this session. Uh, the proposed budget of 89.8 million is an increase of 4.6 million, 5.4% against the current year's budget, uh, and is an increase on the uh, estimated budget we presented to you for this year last year. As members of the committee will no doubt have noted with interest, we've budgeted for a co-location project in respect of the ombudsman who must vacate their current offices and commissioners, which aims to deliver immediate and then longer term savings. And in so doing, we're mindful of the discussion we had at this very session last year with you on the value for money. Excluding this one-off cost, the proposed budget is just 0.8% higher than in 2018-19 indicative forecast to this committee and 3.3% higher than the current year budget. This has been helped by some reductions in certain budget lines, such as rates and savings on the new IT contract relay. The corporate body anticipates that the SBCB's budgets will be set in line with inflation for the remaining years of this parliamentary session and that any remaining upward cost pressures in these areas will be contained within existing resources. Clearly, this is caveated by any significant game-changing events impacting in Parliament. An example of this is the possibility that the SPCB will be invited to fund the Electoral Commission in respect of Scottish elections, although no bill to pursue that has yet been uh, suggested. Turning now to the main drivers of the current budget, uh, on all indicators available to us, the corporate body believe we have moved on to a new level of demand for services which will continue throughout this session. It's busy on the legislative front, and in terms of inquiries, votes, motions and other indicators we can measure, uh, in year we have made a few operational decisions around staffing to meet specific gaps, and uh, this budget proposes some further additional staffing, for example, uh, to address capacity issues in the official report and in public engagement to meet the changing demands around social media and support to committees on engagement. We've also been closely monitoring and assessing the anticipated impact of Brexit for Parliament in terms of scrutiny and legislation. We know this will be complex with challenging deadlines and that there will be additional work to support this on top of existing parliamentary work. We have made some reasonable planning assumptions about what will be required and are proposing additional staffing, primarily in clerks, researchers and lawyers. To reassure the committee, however, we have divided this resource up between permanent and temporary staff to give us some flexibility. 
Against the backdrop of additional work to the Parliament, there is also the broad cross-party support for reform, and the corporate body has had to consider the resources which we require to implement the recommendations, many of them of no cost implication at all, but there are some that do, and we're proposing an additional half a million pounds to contingency at this stage to enable the flexibility to progress this work. Uh, with regard to pay, we are approaching the end of the two-year pay deal for Scottish parliamentary staff, and negotiations will commence in the new year to determine a new pay settlement. Uh, as discussed with the Finance Committee in previous years, MSPs' pay rises are linked to public sector pay rises in Scotland using the annual hours, a survey of hours and earnings published by the Office of National Statistics. Using that index, I can confirm formally that an increase of 0.6% will be applied in April 2018. As we provided analysis of the other costs and various schedules that form part of our budget submission, I won't repeat that information. And in closing, I present the committee with the corporate body's fully considered bid for the financial year 18-19. We've analysed the information available to us over many months, assessed the risks we face and the areas we wish to develop so that we can decisively in this budget uh, continue to provide Parliament with the resources it needs. Our budget is pitched at a level we believe is necessary, proportionate and sustainable in the medium term until the end of this session. And uh, with that, I conclude. Convener, thank, thank you. Thank you very much, Jackson. Um, Murdo. Uh, thank you, Convener. Uh, good morning, um, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for coming along. Um, in your opening remarks, Mr. Carlo, you mentioned the uh, issue of the commissioners and ombudsmen, which the, uh, this committee has looked at in the past. I was just looking at uh, the figures you submitted for the budget bid. Um, so we now have six uh, commissioners uh, and uh, ombudsmen. Uh, the overall cost of that, uh, I note, is, is going up, approaching 11.5 million uh, in the coming year. Some of that is to do with a one-off uh, relocation, which I'm sure you'll tell us more about in due course. But in relation to the, the, the non-capital uh, costs, the one commissioner who seems to have quite a, a large increase in uh, the budget is the Commissioner for Ethical Standards and Public Life, which is up, I note, 10.5 per cent on the uh, current year. I was wondering if you could give us some more detail as to why that particular commissioner has seen such an increase in his uh, uh, projected budget. Well, I'll, I'll let Paul come in as well on this, but um, certainly from our own experience on the corporate body uh, in the submission that the Ethical Standards Commissioner made to us uh, during the course of the year in which he felt this increase was necessary, uh, it reflects an increase in the number of complaints that have actually been received by the Ethical Standards Commissioner, which he is now having to investigate. Uh, and that has increased, I think, significantly, such that it was necessary, I think, for an employment resource to be added to cope with that, if I recall correctly, Paul. Um, yeah, j just to develop that a bit further. So the, um, there are really three components to the increase. The, the biggest, by far, is extra investigatory work. I mean, in the past four years, what we've tended to do is um, fund that through contingency. But... And we budgeted for around about 400 hours of investigatory work a year, but it's actually running at closer to 600. Um, and also, in evidence to the uh, SPPA committee, the commissioner made the point that they're also increasing in complexity. And we felt it was more transparent rather than funding it continually through contingency to be actually upfront and put that in the budget so that you could see that. And that accounts, I think, for about 55,000. The other two components of that. Uh, one, uh, a new um, IT case management system, which we think will support this work. And the final uh, additional budget is 17,000, and that's for uh, potential additional functions around the lobbying register. So the um, Ethical Standards Commissioner will have the function if there are complaints um, uh, under the new regime, which, as you know, comes into place next year, then he has a function. Now, that, that has to be an estimate, and obviously that's something in, when we present next year's budget we'd hopefully be able to firm up on. Uh, with regard, well, can I return to the, uh, the, the co-location? I mean, it is an important consideration, the co-location. The ombudsman does have to move, so uh, there would have been a cost associated with that, even if we hadn't then looked to co-locate with other commissioners. Um, clearly, you know, the various commissioners are, on, uh, are in accommodation which have got variable lifetimes of their existing contracts left, but there is an opportunity at this point uh, to see if we can bring together uh, three of the uh, particular uh, commissioners onto a, a single standalone site. I think we're also of the view that, you know, these aren't necessarily drop-in centres. They don't need to be in prestigious high street accommodation addresses. It's important that they are accessible, certainly, but it is a functioning office. Uh, and we believe that the particular saving that we'll realise 
uh, over the years ahead. And it's difficult to be precise because there are a number of premises that are being looked at. There's a variable saving. We are negotiating, but we think it, uh, it would be cautiously optimistic to say that we could save about half a million pounds in accommodation costs on an ongoing business basis over the next decade. Okay, thank you for that. Um, so you've got a figure, a contingency figure, I appreciate, of 1.75 million for the accommodation project. Uh, can you maybe explain where that figure comes from? Is, is it related to the, the cost of breaking existing leases, for example? Um, sure. Yes, I'll come in on that one. The figure that we've put forward is, at this stage, we haven't got a secured property, so we've put forward a figure which is our understanding of what we would need to put in place for things like um, removal costs, um, IT systems being installed, advisors, other fit-out costs, things like ventilation, because most of what is happening in Edinburgh at the moment is that there's a good market, it's a fluid market, it turns over very quickly, and what we are finding is that that mostly it's shells that are available for rent and any organisation is then going to have to go in and do a fit out to its own standards and obviously we would want to be taken into consideration given the nature of the body's equality considerations of course. Um, so those cover the kind of main um, sort of fees associated with the fit out and the move. Um, we would be seeking to negotiate on things like um, any change in rental because we have got a staggered um, situation with the different properties become um, the, the commissioners and the other office holders having to move at different times. So we would be negotiating around rental um, in the run up to trying to secure a final property. Okay. Okay. And I know others want to come in on this, Bruce. So just 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 one more question, if I can. Are, are the commissioners all enthusiastic and and welcoming about this uh, project? We've been working with the um, commissioners and the other office holders since April of this year on a working group, and they've been working very well with us to consider the option of co-location and the impact of co-location. Um, it's fair to say it's changed, and we have discussed with them. I've met with all of the office holders, and we've discussed the fact that they, as employer, will going have to, they're going to have to manage um, the impact of that for some of their staff. Um, so we're confident that actually we're going to be able to secure something that working with them will meet all of their needs. Are you looking only at properties in Edinburgh? At this stage, we are, yes. The corporate body indicated that because of the continuity of staffing, it would be desirable to look in Edinburgh in the first Notwithstanding instance. Notwithstanding the fact that Edinburgh is the most expensive real estate in Scotland, and these are Scottish national, all of these are Scottish national bodies, yes. and there's no reason why they have to be located in the nation's capital. There is no reason why they have to be located in the nation's capital, but what we did look at was the fact that currently they are located in Edinburgh and that all of their staff are drawn from the surrounding areas, so it would probably be a lot more expensive for us to start to look outside of Edinburgh. It also, they have a range of different working relationships with different bodies that are Edinburgh based as well, and they made representations to us about that and also about the continuity of the staffing that they have and the years of experience that they have in carrying out their jobs. And the corporate body, minded of the big change that this was going to be in terms of co location, were persuaded that Edinburgh first was a, 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 the best option. But, but I would say that, mindful of the very point that you make, um, we also took the view that that didn't necessarily mean, that as, as has been the case in the past, they needed to be located right in the heart and centre of Edinburgh, that there were other opportunities provided by business parks and other locations in the periphery of Edinburgh that might also be suitable for accommodation. And I think they are amongst the places that we are currently also looking to see if we can identify suitable premises. Good, but other towns and cities not very far away from Edinburgh are available at much cheaper um, rental costs. I think what I would say on that, if, if we're unsuccessful in securing um, accommodation which is both value for money and fits purpose, and I think the corporate body I'm sure would, would reconsider that, but as Jackson said, including the peripheral parts of Edinburgh, that's our first option, but clearly if that doesn't prove successful, in other words we can't find a property that the corporate body regards as sufficient value for money and meeting the requirements of the commissioners, then I'm sure the corporate body would would look again at those options. Liam MacArthur has made the <coughs> case in the corporate body for Orkney repeatedly, so we, we, glad to hear we do understand the, the various options that exist. Patrick. Uh, thank you. Good morning. Uh, just to, to follow on from this, and uh, I think Michelle Hegarty mentioned the equality considerations that, that need to be borne in mind with the, the relocation project. 
I'm aware that PCS have expressed concern around the impact uh, of um, distance from the rail network in particular uh, for uh, disabled employees and those with caring responsibilities and that PCS have requested uh, consultation with the SPCB. Uh, uh, you know, the, the, the end principle decision has been made, but clearly the SPCB has further decisions to make which will impact on those staff, uh, despite not being the direct employer. Has there been an agreement to take part in that consultation uh, with PCS? Um, no, because they we're not the employer, as you rightly say. So we're very clear on this point, that the uh, engagement between the PCS is with the employers, who are the commissioners, so I think it would be inappropriate. Uh, I'm very clear on that point. But we do take equalities, obviously, very seriously. So when we have a property identified, and I think as Jackson and Michelle have said, there's a, a number of properties still in play, and there's obviously commercial negotiations going on. Once we've identified a preferred property, we would undertake an equalities impact assessment. And we're very happy, and indeed, uh, I think Michelle has encouraged the commissioners individually to engage with the PCS. Uh, but we're clear that it's not appropriate for us to do so. So the, the design of that equalities impact assessment, the kind of questions that it will ask, it seems reasonable that, that at least should be informed by the views of those representing the people who will be directly impacted by the, the outcome of the decision. Our intention, um, Patrick, is to do the equality impact assessment jointly with the office holders, and we've actually already asked the office holders for previous equality impact assessments that they have done in previous moves before to their current locations to help inform a, an equality impact assessment. So the, the employers themselves, the office holders, they will... They will collaborate with us on the equality impact assessment. And they will commit to including the... the the representative of the workforce in that process? Well, they should, as part of that, bring forward any impacts on staff from an equality perspective as part of that equality impact assessment. Yeah, but you would expect them to include the representative union, the only representative union in, in those... Well, it's really workforce. a matter for them how they engage with the PCS in terms of their staff and the concern, any concerns that would be raised. But the equality impact assessment that we would do, we would collaborate with the office holders yeah. on carrying that out. And it should flush out any equality impact assessments in relation to any staff that they might employ. It, the questions yeah. in that should flush I, that out. I, I appreciate, and there's, there's not a, a, a direct employment relationship, but it would be hard for the SPCB to make a final decision and therefore to, to calculate the impact on its own budget uh, if that process had been taken, part, taken forward without the involvement <coughs> of the union that represents the workforce. Uh, so I, I think we've probably said as much as we can on that. I mean, I think it's obviously a matter for the commissioners to do that. Um, as you say, the corporate body itself will have to judge the um, effectiveness of that, and we will clearly look to see the extent to which the commissioners have engaged you know, with their staff um, and unions, but I'm just keen not to cross the line into telling the employers how to uh, engage with their staff. I think that's the matter for them. But, okay. yeah, I, I think, I think it will be a positive uh, process to do that. We're very serious about it, just to give you that reassurance. Shall I move on to the pay I'll, issues? Come, I'll come back to okay, that. There's still other supplementaries in this area. James. Just on get, going back to the public ombudsman uh, costs, um, in terms of professional fees, there's a projected increase going up from 196,000 to 453,000, which is obviously more than double. I just wondered what the background to that was. Yeah, well, it's a, it's a demand-led organisation and they obviously don't know the, the number of complaints that they're going to have to investigate. Um, so they've got a limited control over that. Over the last seven or eight years, they've had consistently their responsibilities increased by the Parliament. Um, and later, so more public bodies, complaints about more public bodies have been going to them. Um, Recently, um, the government has indicated they also want to set up a new national whistleblowing uh, officer for the NHS, and they've indicated they would like to add that to the ombudsman's responsibilities as well. Um, they've written to the corporate body to ask if they can bring an order before Parliament to do that, and we expect that to come into place next year, and that to be an additional functionality that they will have to take on. The Scottish government will make some provision for the initial running costs, but thereafter that would come back to the corporate body to fund as well. Um, so there's really a, a recognition in there of the increased workload that the, and the new powers that consistently the Ombudsman has had to take on over the piece. 
Okay, I mean, I can appreciate the, there's an increased number of complaints. I know that from, you know, constituents that I deal with. Um, and obviously you've outlined the position in relation to increased uh, powers. Uh, however, I'm just not entirely clear why it's, it's gone up by more than double. Um, I don't think there's anything else. If you'd like, James, we can take that away and yeah. more sure. than happy to write back to you on the... I can, I can uh, you know, sure, we'll happily drop fine. you a note just to explain the detail. Yeah, the calculation that we've made and agreed is all related to the new functions yeah. of the Ombudsman and the assessment of what the, impl the implication is for that going forward. OK, that's fine. Uh, just on that, I mean, the, the, uh, Jackson said in his opening remarks that you're anticipating that you'll come back to us with future budgets in line with inflation. Um, the, I anticipate that the Ombudsman's functions are going to be very significantly enhanced after the Social Security um, Bill is enacted, assuming it is enacted, um, because I anticipate that um, complaints about the new Scottish Social Security Agency will be investigated by the Ombudsman. Uh, it, may, it, it, may, it may be that I'm wrong about that, but it may be that um, uh, that, that does indeed happen. Have you factored that in? to this increase, or are you going to be coming back to us next year or thereafter with further significant increases uh, because the Ombudsman, Ombud, Ombudsman's workload after Social Security has been uh, devolved, or after devolved Social Security comes into force, is likely to very significantly to increase? I don't think we've scoped out, um, because it's a bit further ahead than we can, what that additional responsibility would be. So I think, as I said, at the start as well, if there were any significant additional new responsibilities over and above those that we have okay. anticipated, then that probably would lead to a further review of the cost. Would that so, this, so just to be clear, this doubling of the Ombudsman's budget because of increased workload does not take into account devolved Social Security? Uh, it, it's not a doubling of the budget. I mean, the budget year-on-year -year increase for the Ombudsman, I think, is around... Is about I'm, two, about two, the, two I'm or talking 3%. about the figures that James Kelly put to you. I mean, is that from the, the, 190 something to 400 and something. That's, yeah, that, that's, that's a doubling. Not a doubling of the the overall budget's up, I think, to two or three percent. Just to reassure you on that, um, so it's not a doubling of the budget. Um, there, are, if there's a detail within it, we'll check that out and get back to you. But it's not a doubling budget. It's actually quite a modest increase. Uh, and the Ombudsman is a, a, an organisation that's had a lot of additional functions. Y your social security point is a well-made point. But looking at the timing and scale of that, I think it would not have been sensible in this round to try to speculate on that. Uh, once that's in place, and if the Parliament decides that, uh, that actually the Ombudsman should take that, I think that might be one of those uh, significant issues that Jackson Carlo alluded to, and we'd have to work through quite carefully. Um, uh, yes, I mean, I'm aware, as you are, of the scale of the operation, and that might well be. But I think it's just not possible to speculate this far out. So I think that's why Jackson quite properly indicated there are one or two potentially very significant changes that would have to come back, which is why our undertaking that this is a medium-term budget has to have that caveat in. It may well be by this time next year we're able to have a, a more informed discussion with the committee as to how th what that might look like. And critically, what the timeline is, um, you know, as you know yourself, it's coming on stream um, in steps, and we could look at that with you as well. I think Derek could maybe just speak to um, the point about the numbers, just to clarify any confusion arising there. Yeah, just in terms, in, on Schedule 4B that you've got that gives the breakdown of the revenue costs, the SPSO for 17-18 showed the new functions as a single figure of 1 million, but for 18-19 that's been allocated out into the individual lines, so that's why the individual lines are showing such a big increase relative to the total. He's Professional fees, yeah. Yeah, but the pre the previous year's figure was what 196. So I would have assumed that that was that was sitting on the the same line, and it was a like by like comparison. But, but the the new functions that were budgeted in 1718 were just put in as a single figure of a million, and that's now been allocated out into the individual components. In the same column that you've identified, the 190, you'll see a million at the bottom of that, which is now in this year been allocated out into the line items. Yeah. So, so the total's gone from 4304 to 4400. Yeah, I understand about the overall total, but on that individual line, you're showing 1718 at 196. So I'm assuming that you've bro broken that million figure down uh, uh, to the particular responsibilities, and then it's gone up to 453 million. So it is still a doubling. And on that individual line. 
it's just showing as a total for 1718, but what we could do is analyze that 1 million yeah, and, I think and, and just, allocate it over. I, if you yeah. just, I, I think, James, for, for your sake and I think for my own as well, but we can, I think, write you a detailed note on yeah. that. On that, but, but just to reassure the point uh, in response to Mr. Tonkin, the overall increase is 2.2 percent um, year on year, just to um, for the ombudsman as a whole. But we'll we'll write you a detailed note on that particular point. Alexander, is it on commissioners as well? So just go back to location. Yeah. Okay. So just quickly back to location. When you're looking for uh, relocation of the offices, uh, and you say you have to be in Edinburgh because of a staffing issue, is the is the radius of where you're looking the same as for MSPs who have to commute in daily? We'd be looking in the wider Edinburgh area and peripheral Edinburgh. But the same distance that you apply for MSPs who don't get uh, accommodation there. That would be broadly. It. broadly yeah. I mean, there are three zones, as you know. Yeah. There are three zones, as you know, for members, and uh, we haven't looked at it. I mean, that's a very precise thing defined in the expenses scheme. We haven't looked at it with that precision, but yeah, broadly speaking, we're looking at the Greater Edinburgh area. So that would include, I think, as Jackson himself okay. said, things like the business parks out at the Gyle, okay. north of Edinburgh as well as centre. Just to give you, uh, so they're not exactly the same, but broadly speaking, yes. Okay. Uh, before we move on to general staffing issues, I'll just go on further question on the commissioners' issues because in our draft report um, for 1718, the committee welcomed the suggestion from the corporate group body that may wish to consider undertaking a review of the SPCB supported office holders, and we invited you at that stage to consider that issue. Now it's now almost been almost we're almost at 20 years since the Parliament's been in. Place. And obviously, I know these commissioners have come on at different stages, the Ombudsman at different stages. So, and, but given that, you know, that the Parliament has been in place, place that length of time and we've now got all the this architecture, where have we got to with that review? Um, it would be interesting to understand, because I think it probably is about time we did something serious on that. I think we fair to say, Convener, I mean, in this particular year, we have looked at savings that can be achieved through co-location and other efficiencies. Uh, in the Parliament before last, uh, I certainly sat on a committee of the Parliament when proposals were made to reduce the number of commissioners and, crucially at that point, uh, to consider the creation of additional commissioners. There was talk in that Parliament of a Veterans Commissioner, of an Older People's Commissioner, and there was the prospect of a very considerable extension in the number of commissioners overall. Uh, in the event, some of the proposals that Parliament then considered met with quite considerable resistance in terms of merging some of the commissioners. Uh, I think the corporate body in this particular year looking at uh, the various things I identified in my opening remarks, Brexit, the Parliamentary Reform Commission and the additional powers that are coming to us otherwise, um, have not specifically initiated what would be a further more detailed piece of work on the commissioners. But if this committee was again to suggest to us that they felt that was something we should do, then it's something we would certainly consider doing. Okay. Ash Denham. Thank you, Kavina. Good morning. I'm just looking at Schedule 3 of your paper, um, and that's the one where you've broken down the new staffing. So the one I'm interested in is the 13 new operational posts. Um, obviously, you said you're taking them on to allow the Parliament to fulfil its scrutiny role with regard to constitutional issues and Brexit. So I'm interested in those roles and what the split will be between that you've listed five areas here. So committee, legal, spice, media and BIT. Can you give me an idea of, of how that will fall between the 13? Yeah, I think Paul is best placed to speak to that. Thank you. Um, so um, five in the legal office, two in the committee office, four uh, researchers in spice um, and one each in media and BIT. Um, they're a mixture of permanent and temporary. Um, it's probably important to make a, a, one overall uh, comment, I think picks up a point that Jackson Carlow made. Um, we have to be flexible as well. So um, as, as this committee knows better than any, we don't exactly know what the sort of scrutiny load will be, particularly around constitutional change, but also new powers which mustn't be forgotten um, coming online, social security and others. And so when we see how that pans out, we may flex that, but that, that's our starting point, that breakdown. Um, if we need to flex that through the year, because, for example, we need more mm. researchers or fewer lawyers, then clearly we'll do that. But that, that, that's our starting assumption for those 13 posts. Okay. Because obviously you, you've listed six here for public engagement, which I know is, is part of another yeah. um, change to the Parliament's um, role. But do we think, we think that's going to be enough for member support, you know, if we are taking on a considerable amount of work, or it's just too early to say whether it will be sufficient? It, 
I, I don't know. So we, we, you'll see we also explained how our contingency is fitted this year, and I would reassure the committee that the highest call on the contingency would be scrutiny work around any form of constitutional change, whether that's new powers or Brexit process itself or additional responsibilities that might come on the far side. So we feel this is as far as we can go with our current analysis. And rather than just pack out more posts, mm -hmm. we've actually put some money in the contingency. Um, and it would be the first call on the contingency if we needed additional posts in that in those areas. OK, thank you. Ivan. Uh, thanks, Gunnar. Thanks for coming along this morning. Um, I, I mean, just looking at the thing uh, in the round, we've now got uh, the budget's over 100 million for the first time in total. So it's a not inconsiderable amount of, of taxpayers' money we're dealing with here. Um, Having said that, I'm, I'm glad to see that there's obviously some cost. Uh, you're taking it seriously in terms of the value for money agenda, and that's obvious. And there's some cost areas where I can see IT purchasing, etc., where you've made some reductions, which is great to see. I'm kind of intrigued by um, the 45% number that, that Jackson Carlow mentioned at the start in terms of the increase in, uh, in workload. Uh, and I suppose I'd just like to, to ask for your, um, any more information you've got on that, where that is, and then following on from that in, in terms of the staff positions that, that sit behind processing some of that work, what kind of analysis you've done or what's ongoing in terms of um, streamlining process, process mapping reviews, etc., to understand, right, there's a couple of jobs here that are very similar and there, 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 there's a lot of admin going on here, we can maybe take some of that out and make it a bit more efficient, etc. Um, so you yeah, maybe just want to reflect on some of that. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Uh, I mean, actually, one of the things that I think is quite commendable within the operation of the Parliament the last year is that a very considerable amount of the increase that we've seen has been accommodated from within existing resource. Some of that 45%, which makes up the headline, I think we would probably agree between us, is not necessarily labour intensive. So the fact that more motions mm -hmm. are tabled by members uh, and considerably more have been is not in itself a significant increase in cost. But committee meetings meeting uh, is a significant additional cost. Um, in the last session, uh, there had been 367 committee meetings. In the first year, there have been 427 in this uh, meeting for 798 hours. So, the, And committees are meeting more regularly. I mean, members here will know uh, committees that may have met once a fortnight previously are routinely meeting once a week. And there is a commitment in terms of official uh, record and uh, parliamentary resource that's associated with that in particular. Uh, I think in addition to that, uh, there are, we are partially anticipating uh, things within the Reform Commission where there are suggestions that uh, committees could meet at the same time as Parliament is in session, and that would add quite deliberately uh, a cost to the Parliament because we don't currently have to provide services duly when that takes place. So there would be additional costs quite specifically associated with us being able to do that. So, I mean, it's, a, I mean, it's an interesting thing that, generally speaking, uh, members in this session have been very engaged and the number of uh, motions taking place, even, in fact, the, the number of new bills being presented by members, there, are, there is a considerable additional commitment coming from that. But I'll let Sir Paul just flesh that out a bit further again. Yeah, I mean, in addition to that, so that the 45% relates to, for example, motions and questions. That, so they're, they're up. But to give you a bit more flavour, um, in this uh, first year of this session compared to the first year of the last session, which I think is the best comparison, um, committee time is up about 8%, chamber time up about 12%. If you were to take committee time back to the beginning of session three, it's nearly 40% higher. So... You know, in terms of just the productivity of the organisation, I think that's quite quite substantial. Um, we've done a number of things over the years. Uh, quite significant reforms of actually the committee office system. Um, and your own clerks, no doubt, could talk to you about this. But, you know, a much more flexible system um, so that the more senior clerks um, take on responsibility for more committees. We have more adaptability. So essentially, we could try to move the staff to where the uh, issues are. Um, clearly, we've used technology um, to improve systems. A number of the project investments we have ahead, maybe not in the next year, but the years beyond, for example, the committee agenda system um, can help us with that. We're looking specifically at an interesting project, which is a collaboration between ourselves and, and other uh, uh, parliaments around uh, the legislative drafting system. I mean, this is the legacy from nearly, as the convener pointed out, nearly 20 years ago. 
um, and it, it, it's no longer supported. So we've had a joint procurement project to basically develop um, a new system which will actually improve the effectiveness of drafting from the government side through to our own side and hopefully provide a better service for committees looking at how legislation changed the process. So, okay. so and I, I, the final assurance and, and, and Michelle uh, Hegarty chairs our strategic resources board and when they look at any project bid, usually technology related but not always, but particularly there, they always look for where's the business efficiency from this to give you that, that assurance. So I hope we try to inbuild it in the way mm. we do it and those few specific examples okay. I hope illustrate what we're trying no, to do. No, that's fine. Just, just been on one very, very specific and this may not be relevant but it's something that we see. You mentioned motions um, and I think being new, we've kind of got into the habit of doing what other people do which is generating motions on practically anything that happens in your constituency. Um, now, is that process fairly automated or is there costs there that are, that are significant? Because frankly, when you look at some of this stuff, a lot of it, there are motions that are very, very important, but there are many you look at and you may think, yeah. this looks like a waste of somebody's time. It, it is automated, yeah. it's pretty that, efficient. Right. Okay, so, so, so I mean, not, it, it, it's, yeah. it has a cost, but I wouldn't want to it's overstate that. And okay. uh, of course, okay. with the high volume, that further incentivizes us to look at how we can streamline it. Okay, that's fine. In other words, you're asking, does it cost more than the £10 that we're celebrating in the motion that's been awarded to Correct. somebody? Correct, yes, <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> okay, uh, and my very last question, and you may or may not be able to comment or answer this. Um, if, and we waved a magic wand and somebody decided that Brexit wasn't a good idea after all, um, and you didn't have to budget for costs associated with, with Brexit, um, how much could you, uh, could you save? Well, it's not the corporate body's business, of course, to anticipate what it, the political background or associated business of Brexit would be. We simply are charged with ensuring that the parliament can function in all circumstances. Uh, I, I don't think we would. We have. I don't think actually we have quantified what it wouldn't cost to go ahead with Brexit. Although obviously we have identified what extra roles you need to put in to deal with extra workload caused by yes, Brexit. And you've been quite I clear suspect about that. even rolling that back would probably have a, a certain cost implication. But I don't know if I... Have we a specific... I don't think we've looked at it that way round. Yes, it's hard to be too, too precise. Well, you know how many roles you're talking about yeah, that I mean, additional because of Brexit? The, the, there's two points I would make, um, and obviously it's, it's a politically delicate uh, issue. It's a matter of fact. Um, in terms of our response to it. So we're in the middle of it already. I mean, you, you will know, and this committee is a good example. Uh, so though, although technically Brexit hasn't happened, the Parliament is heavily engaged with the process, uh, both through its committees and through, through plenary. So, um, and, and given that uh, the corporate body's job is to provide the services the Parliament requires, mm -hmm. uh, we have to work on the basis that it's going ahead until we hear something different. Um, and so, and you'll notice that we talked about extra post, we talked about Brexit and constitutional issues. It's, I mean, it's raised the whole constitutional debate and a lot of the engagement of committees and plenary might have sort of a Brexit element, but often strays into other areas as well. So it's quite difficult just to pick it out. But you'll see in Schedule 3, and I don't think we could probably say anything more than we've said in Schedule 3. That's our, our best estimate of where we stand on it. But to pick up the point I made in response to uh, Ash Denham, you know, there's obviously further contingency because we, we just don't know how it's going to play out, but we've not reverse engineered it um, in the way you've asked, so it isn't possible to put an okay. exact figure on it. Thank you. Um, can I just go back to pick up on some of the stuff Ash Denham was asking? Because one of the things, in looking at the, the additional staffing requirements, you know, obviously the 13 new operational posts for committee legal, spice, media, and BIT, um, the six additional posts for public outreach work and a further seven posts support increased level of demand for other parliamentary support. Given that, as Adam Tompkins um, alluded to earlier, we are now going to be taking on additional social security powers, this committee and other committees will become much more involved in the fiscal framework issues, the budget adjustment processes, Tax and borrowing, Fiscal Commission, Revenue Scotland. Um, that's before I get to any of the Brexit issues around the legislation that will come to the Parliament here, whether it's fisheries bills, environment bills, trade bills, all of the issues to do with the supplementary legislation surrounding that. Um, I just want to be absolutely sure, in terms of the balance we've got here between the, the different staffing increases, that 
that we're sure that you're as convinced as you can be that the, the balance is right here between what's coming in in terms of operational posts and the other areas. And what uh, beyond the contingency you described to Ash Denham, what, what room for flexibility have you left yourselves if it proves that the additional posts you've identified for operational purposes are not sufficient? I mean, I think you make a very important point, and, and it is a re the reason why we have chosen to put a very, very considerable sum, I think half a million pounds, into contingency, because we recognise that we can't anticipate the way all of these things will unfold or the order in which they will unfold, and there are clearly some very important issues straight ahead of us. Some of the engagement issues arising from the Reform Commission have yet actually to emerge back out of discussion within the various parts of this parliament who are looking at how that might operate. So I think we are mindful of the point you make, uh, Sir Paul. Yeah. No, I, I, absolutely. Um, there's also a detailed point I may come back to, convener, on the public engagement posts. But we think there's uh, sufficient flexibility. Um, and just to reiterate the point that we've been monitoring this very carefully, even before the year, financial year begins, uh, you will know how things are moving um, as we move into next year, we'll start to get a clearer idea, particularly around the scrutiny burden around subordinate legislation, say. Um, and just to absolutely reassure the committee, if we uh, detect at all that we don't have the sufficient resources to deal with that, we will switch resources into it, and we believe there's enough flexibility in the budget to do that. Uh, on the engagement post, it may be worth just pointing out as a, a point of detail, and I do apologise, this doesn't maybe come out as clearly as it could in Schedule 3. Uh, we talk about establishing six permanent uh, public engagement posts. In fact, I mean, three of these posts are already filled on a temporary basis, so they're not six new posts. I mean, three of them will be new. Um, the other three, we've taken a judgment they've been filled temporarily using contingency others. We're, we're persuaded that there's a case for making them permanent. Uh, but just to be clear, whereas the 13 posts above are all new posts on top of it. So, um, again, as I reflected on that, that might have been rather more clearly explained, but I hope that gives you some further reassurance as to where we see the balance of priorities. That's helpful. Obviously, you, the, there have been some moves already in terms of providing Parliament with support and advice on Brexit, because there's now, I see from my inbox, a Brexit unit being established within SPICE. Can you tell me what sort of consultation was held with committee, um, you know, particular committees who are I'm thinking, that, frankly, I've had no consultation about that Brexit unit before it was set up, and I would have thought that the customers, i.e. the conveners, the clerks, etc., who were involved materially in these issues at this stage would have had some consultation before it was set up uh, about you know, what's the expertise, what it's going to do, what are our needs. But I'm not aware of that. Now, there may be stuff going on that I'm not aware of, and that, that Mr Johnson or clerks are aware, are aware of that I'm not. But what, are you aware of what consultation went on before it was set up? I would have thought so too, so I'm surprised to hear that you didn't know about it. What I would, so what I would say, I mean, I think it is a, a worthwhile development and I think it draws in uh, external as others and what I will take away straight after this meeting is go and talk to my colleagues as to how, as we take that, as we develop that unit, how we can make sure that it does uh, engage with committee, especially lead committees such as this, to make sure that it is meeting your requirements. Um, so, I mean, it's, it's a sort of reorganisation of resources within SPICE to give a clearer focus. Um, it particularly draws in, um, and I know you've benefited from their input yourselves, experts sitting outside Parliament. We think that's a really important part of this. Um, but if you convene, I don't feel you've been sufficiently consulted or at all on it, then that does surprise me, and it's something that I think we can rectify. I mean, it's only just begun um, and will not be something fixed in stone. So I can give you an absolute assurance that they will engage with you. And if you have some particular views as to how that unit might develop going forward, then obviously we'll take that into account. I certainly think that myself and other committee members might want to talk to or understand yeah. what they're going to do. Particularly, it's not, it's not just about the, just now, it's about later, the common frameworks, the various pieces of legislation that will follow and the support that all committees affected who are going to be involved in this process are going to need. Um, so I think I would wel welcome that discussion. Now, listen, there may have been something that dropped into my entry a few months ago I didn't notice. So if it did, forgive me, but I'm not aware of it. No, no, it's, it's a very fair point. And uh, even if that was the case, I think it would actually be a very productive thing for the colleagues leading that unit to come and have some discussions with the committee just to understand your perspective as to how you'd like it to support your work going forward. 
Okay. Inc um, incidentally, convener, here. just say in relation to spice, I think I'm right in saying, Michelle, there's been a 21% increase in the first year of this Parliament over the last year of the last Parliament in the number of inquiries members have made of spice yeah. itself. Yeah, I've got to say that the advice we've had from them through the process so far of, of the, the whole issue of Brexit, and indeed the budget's been fantastic, but mm. um, just to put that on record. Emma, okay. and I'll come to Patrick. Thank you, convener. Good morning, everybody. Um, We've heard a lot about the establishment of the six permanent uh, public engagement posts, and I'm interested in the outreach activity. So if we are going to go out there and engage in rural Scotland and the people out there, there's obviously going to be cost implications for accommodation and travel for the outreach. So what, how would that look? Well, a, a very large, one of the principal recommendations arising from the Commission on Parliamentary Reform was a, a new focus on public engagement. Uh, the public engagement unit working with committees is designed to stimulate committee engagement beyond Parliament itself, uh, with a view to trying to solicit fresh witnesses with different perspectives that obviously can be brought to the consideration of the legislation we're undertaking. Uh, so a lot of the resources actually in seeking to find ways in which that much broader base of uh, potential witnesses will be able to engage with committees and enrich parliamentary life and hopefully involve them much more in the whole process of the development of and consideration of legislation going through Parliament. There was a very strong feeling as somebody who sat in the Parliamentary Reform Commission as we went round Scotland that that engagement currently was sporadic and that Parliament was inclined to hear very often from what was broadly termed the usual suspects mm -hmm. and not necessarily from a much broader uh, community Scotland in terms of the evidence it was hearing. But I think that was a large part of what underpinned the recommendation, uh, which is within the report, which Parliament has, I think, in a nominal way said it wishes to support, but there's a lot of, I think, detail before we get to that. But I think Michelle can probably... Yeah, that's exactly it. I mean... I think a lot of um, committees in the Parliament have reflected over the piece that they, the one thing that they hear a lot of is the, from the usual suspects, as, as Jackson's alluded to. And um, the outreach work has been very much about obviously helping people who can add value to the committee's deliberations be prepared to come forward and to undertake that. And that can be obviously... Um, quite a, you know, it's a difficult experience for people and especially some of the subject matter can be very difficult for them to, to convey as well. And I think we did have a really good example around the homelessness inquiry where a lot of that outreach support was on, first of all, working with two voluntary sector organisations to identify people who would be able to come forward to the committee and share their actual daily experiences and also preparing them and giving them support the entire way through the process up to and giving evidence to the committee and that is time intensive it requires a specific skill set and, and that's the investment that the outreach um, team want to make now converting uh, two of the temporary posts into permanent posts based on the experience that they've provided to committees and, and the end results of that that have impacted on the, the uh, quality of the committee work. I think, I, I mean, I support it. I think it's great. We need, to, you know, rural Scotland, we need to be getting out there and speaking to people. So I welcome it. So. You had a wider question on efficiency issues. Yes, well. OK, you, I'll, I'll go with that. Now. Yes. Um, I'm interested in also in the efficiencies then of the Scottish Parliament's corporate body. How do we compare with uh, other assemblies, governments, Ireland, UK, Wales, for instance, um, if we are now working at over... 45% increase in the business, um, and I know everyone feels that. How do we compare to other parliaments? What to take a... Uh, thank, thank you, Jackson. Um, Probably not for me to say. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I mean, obviously, I'd like to say very well, but um, benchmarking is difficult, but I could give you an example. Um, benchmarking the UK parliament is just incredibly different. It's, it's such a different... It's bicameral. It's, it's a huge, huge organisation. What, what we do is often look at individual services as very strong links, whether it's technology, security, clerking, research. You know, talks about SPICE, their links with the House of Commons, so library. So we look at that. It may not be sort of efficiency type benchmarking, but we're always looking to see what we can learn from each other. I think in, in, in raw uh, numbers, for example, the total staffing complement now in the Scottish Parliament is around 500. Uh, the staffing complement, I think the Welsh Assembly is around 450. 
So, you know, I think that suggests that we're not far out of kilter. Um, I mean, they have a whole range of responsibilities, of course, but many fewer members. And, and so, you know, I mean, in that it gives you some comfort on benchmarking. From time to time, we've looked at it to see whether it can actually be done numerically, but it's there's just too many variables, and I'd be worried we'd get something misleading. So what we try to do is, across individual services, work with especially our colleagues in other parliaments uh, uh, within the UK to see what we can learn from each other. And the, um, the legislative drafting um, uh, development I referred to in an earlier question, that's an example of where we actually decided we could gain efficiencies by collaborating. So I think we're paying, I think, less than 10% of the development costs of that new system by sharing the development with other partners, the Scottish Government and some of the UK players. So uh, that's probably as much as I can say, but I hope it reassures you that we, we do take it very seriously and we look to see what we can learn from other institutions. Okay, thanks. Patrick. Thank you. Um, I was going to come on to pay. Just, just very briefly before that, if you are looking for comments on the, the Brexit unit, uh, they published a, an interactive Brexit timeline on Monday of this week, uh, and I think that is awesome comic timing. They've set themselves a very, very high standard there to, to maintain. Um, on public, uh, on pu the, the staff pay issue, uh, aside from the number of, of staff that the Parliament needs, uh, I think Jackson Carlaw mentioned uh, that you're coming to the end of a two-year pay deal. And the, the paper here says, for budgetary purposes, we've made provision for a percentage increase to be applied from the end of... Uh, uh, to be applied from April 2018 and for incremental progression within agreed pay scales. Now, is that an intention for another two-year period or is that for a one-year period from, from next year? Yeah, no, I, I, I think we are in the process of being about to embark on a negotiation, as I think all I would safely want to say. Uh, that, that negotiation last time round led to a two-year pay deal, um, but the negotiation starts afresh, and I don't think at this stage we have set out um, any conclusions or expectations of what we might uh, arrive at. I mean, I, I don't think I'd want to prejudice it beyond that, I, but I, we don't, we, I couldn't say any more than okay, that. Okay, so that's yeah. an open question at this It's point. an open question, yes. okay. that's what I'd say. Uh, and further in that paragraph, it says, uh, discussions would take place once the SPCB has agreed a negotiating limit, so uh, a, a, a negotiating remit. So I, I'm assuming that you haven't got to that point since, since this paper was written. That's true. Will that take into account the outcome of the Scottish budget process. Obviously, one of the issues that the Scottish Government is under pressure on is uh, to achieve an inflation, or an, at least an inflation-based increase in the public sector pay settlement uh, for its own employees. And there's a, a, a consequent sense of uh, an expectation of leadership to other public bodies, other public employers uh, in the public sector. Um, so will the SPCB's approach take into account the outcome of that uh, Scottish Government uh, pay policy uh, in, in respect of an inflation-based settlement, if that's what happens? Yeah, well, uh, uh, corporate body has to look at lots of things. We do look at comparators, uh, not just the Scottish Government, though that would be one to reassure you on that. But bearing in mind we're an independent service, not, not linked to the Scottish Government. Affordability is a key uh, question. Uh, we have a long history of fruitful negotiations with the unions, um, which includes, in our case, also the PCS, but two other unions as well. Um, so we also look ahead in setting that remit as to what we might anticipate um, our staff would want, Patrick. So there's a, there's a range of issues, but to, yes, one of the factors we would look at uh, would be anything we understand as to the sort of broader economic climate and the approach that the Scottish Government and its agencies are taking to their pay. It may not be a determining factor, but it would certainly be one relevant factor we would consider. And, and so in terms of what, what has been budgeted for, uh, the, you're confident that the budget would allow that flexibility, the budget as proposed would allow that flexibility if that's the, the position that's agreed? We believe so. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Willie. Thanks very much, Bruce. Uh, good morning to you. I just wonder if I could ask you a wee bit about digital services in the Parliament. Uh, I think the Parliament's digital presence is really good and, and very strong, and the support from all the IT teams is, is absolutely first class. But you mentioned in your paper that we'll be investing in upgrading the Parliament's website. Could you give us a little glimpse of what we, we might be looking forward 
to seeing in there, please? I think Michelle's the best person to, to take us forward on that. Yeah, that, good morning. That's a, a, a big project that's just kicked off. Um, and it's been on the radar for a little while. The last website was brought into place in 2011. And since then, technology, as you'll be aware, has moved on apace. In fact, m most organisations now, they don't do a big build of a website, then leave it, and then come back and rebuild it again. So the intention would be that we would do a step change this time. We would, we do need a new platform because our current one is um, unsustainable in the long term. But what we are intending to do is um, put in place a website that can be iteratively developed over the intervening years so that we don't have to do a huge build again, which is costly. And it also gives us the opportunity if we use the right technologies to flexibly improve it as it goes forward. So the, um, the stage that they're at at the moment is actually uh, scoping out a roadmap for the website, how it's going to be delivered. Um, they're getting a lot of user feedback. In fact, yesterday the team was in the garden lobby trying to talk to members and get their feedback on the existing website and what they might want from a future website. Um, and as a result of all of this sort of user involvement, the attention then is to bring forward a beta version in the 1819 financial year, which people can actually have um, a play about with and give feedback on. And then at some point over the next two years to completely move away from the current site and to have the new site. But that will also be an investment. It's, it's in all of the online services. It's not just the website. It will also be on the intranet, which is for the staff and the organisation around the various things that we have to do to manage our, our daily business and also the members portal and where that goes next because there's been a lot of feedback about that as well. Mm -hmm. Emma there mentioned uh, about public engagement and the usual suspects was, was mentioned in discussion. Do you, ever, do you see that we'll get to a point where the public out there directly can participate in things like Scottish Parliament committees through... Skype or Twitter or submitting questions, suitably moderated, of course, because it does happen and uh, it happens in other forums. And I'm just wondering if the Parliament might embrace that through the committees and even through the parliamentary website so that the public have got direct access to communicate with members of the Parliament. Yeah, I, I think this is a really interesting uh, area. In fact, I've had some direct experience when I was giving evidence uh, earlier this year to the um, Environment Committee. Um, I came in early and they were doing a moderated session exactly as you describe. So they, um, through Facebook Live, they were taking questions suitably moderated by, uh, uh, by one of my colleagues. And then the committee, uh, and it had some expert witnesses, was actually trying to take those. And I thought it was a really interesting experiment in sort of direct democracy. I think from the corporate body's point of view, we'd, we'd want to be led by committees on this. So, you know, if, if, if there's demand out there from committees, and there clearly is some, then I think we would feel that we've got the technological capability to support you in that. But I think it should be driven by the business of the parliament. We don't, don't get too carried away investing in, in, in clever new technologies if it's not demanded by the committee. But if committees want to move in that direction, we think we've got some of the technical capability now. But as we go forward, we'd make sure that was built in. Yeah, I mean, it's one way in which you can distribute and, and share the life and work of the Parliament and parliamentarians with the whole of Scotland rather than just Edinburgh, for example, where people have to come here to have an experience of what goes on. So using the digital technology, you can distribute that to anywhere in Scotland, from Shetland right down to, to the border. So I look forward to some opportunities to actually do some of that work in the future. Thank you. OK, thanks, Willie. James? Uh, thanks, Convener. Um, just going back to the staff budget again, You've, in relation to staff, staff turnover, you've built in a figure of 540,000, which in effect is like a, a credit, you know, because you're saying that there'll be some periods where there's a, understandably, there's a gap between somebody leaving and recruiting. So just in terms of staff retention, what what is our trend like? Are we confident enough that we're retaining our experienced and professional staff and also that we're following up in recruitment so that, there's, that these gaps are minimised? Uh, yeah, yes, we do. We have very good staff retention. Um, we face... So, um, and yeah, the 2% um, is, is, is something that Derek advises on, and that means that I think we, that's 
fair. No, we don't feel we should budget for the full amount. We think that's prudent. But no, we have uh, we have very good staff retention, especially in key areas, clerking, research. Um, like many organisations, we struggled to recruit in highly buoyant markets like IT and, and legal. Um, and we've been looking very creatively, especially in the IT side. So, for example, we've been recruiting people more directly from college and university, uh, where we can often attract people. I think we accept they might only stay with us for three or four years. Uh, we really struggle to compete in that mid-market where lots of other organisations frankly outbid us in terms of what they can pay but uh, but across the piece I think I'm very pleased it also enables us to invest with confidence in those staff that we feel we're going to get payback in terms of their expertise and that's been I think a hallmark of the parliament um, over our in entire lifetime so okay okay I thank the panel very much for coming along this morning it's been a good good session um, uh, and I now move this committee into private session.